Section 3. Testing Python Applications with PyTest In this section, we'll take a look at different levels of testing and how to use PyTest for our testing needs. We'll start out with the lowest level type of testing, unit testing, and we'll see how we can measure how much of our code is tested. We'll then step out and write some more high-level tests so that we cover the functionalities that our application must have. In the meantime, we'll also see how we can rethink development by writing tests first. Exciting stuff! Let's jump right in! Unit testing and coverage. In this video, we'll take a look at the lowest level type of testing, unit testing, what it is and how we use it. We'll also check out how we can use coverage to measure how much of our code is tested. So what is unit testing? Or maybe a better question would be, what is a unit? To put it simply, a unit is the smallest testable part of your application. Clears everything right up, doesn't it? You will find many interpretations of what is the smallest testable part of your application, but in many instances, you can consider a method or function as a unit. In that case, a unit test is a test performed on a function or method in your application. This is how we'll use unit testing in this course. But what's the point, you may ask? There's a whole bunch of reasons why you should consider writing unit tests for your code. I'm going to list here just a few that might help you out in your journey as a Python developer. Easier changes in code. This is probably the biggest benefit. Unit tests can provide peace of mind when making big or small code changes. Productivity. Another important factor to consider while developing applications is that every change you make requires you to run the application and, at the very least, check if the functionality you changed is working as expected. You'll do this a lot of times during a workday, so why not write a unit test that walks through the flow that you are doing automatically? Documentation You're probably familiar with the other thing developers don't really love doing, documentation. Documenting code is a pretty boring task compared to the exciting development time. Well, unit tests provide some great examples on how to use your code, so you get to write documentation while writing code, two in one, and design. If you're new to writing tests, you'll probably notice quite quickly that your code is super hard to test and all that spaghetti code you thought was easier to write is close to impossible to work with outside of the current implementation. That's a turning point. You either give up writing tests right there, or you start refactoring your code for better testability and reusability. History says that if you power through it, refactor the code and don't give up on writing tests, you'll end up with better looking code and all the other benefits of unit testing. Plus, much respect from any other developer that has to work with your code. As you can see, there are quite a few benefits for, of writing unit tests. You'll find even more examples on the internet, but the best way is to just get your hands dirty and see for yourself. Let's check out how a unit test looks like. The idea here is that we need to set up some known context and parameters for a function to run, and then we need to check the output or outcome of that function. Basically, put some stuff in and check if what we get out is what we expected. There are a few things to consider before jumping in and writing unit tests to make sure we get the benefits we described before. First, your unit test should have consistent results. This means that we need to get the same results every time we run a test if the code we are testing doesn't change. If your unit tests are not reliable, they will not be very useful since you won't know if there are issues with your code or with the tests themselves. Unit tests should not rely on each other. This means that we need to be able to run unit tests independently and get the same results we would get if we run all of them at the same time. As your application grows, you'll notice that the number of unit tests will rise quickly. To minimize the time it takes to test a particular part of your code, unit tests need to be runnable separately. This also helps with the reliability part. And unit tests should be automatic. Don't rely on human interaction in your unit tests. Humans are unpredictable. Don't trust humans. This means that all parts of the unit tests should be automatic. Context setup, running, and checking results should all be done by the machine. Unit tests that generate reports or other data that needs to be checked manually are pretty useless. Before we jump in, I'd like to mention that this video is split in two parts. In the first part, we'll see how to write some simple tests to get to know the tools and practices, and in the second part, we'll create some more complex unit tests and we'll also measure how much code we've tested. 
With that in mind, let's write some tests. We have our trusty Flickr photo downloader right here. Let's write some tests for it. We wrote this Python script because we wanted an easy programmatic way of downloading 100 interesting photos from Flickr. But things are getting quite serious now. We've published our module to PyPI, we have some traction, developers love it, users love it, and we're already thinking about adding more functionalities to it. This is a perfect moment to make sure any changes we make will not affect our current functionality by writing some tests. First of all, let's check how we initialize our component. Well, there's really no initialization going on as we have a plain module and there's just one method we call. We would like to extend the functionalities of this module, so let's think about it in a more object-oriented fashion. We'll put all our functions here in a class and we'll call it Flickr Downloader. Same functionality, download interesting photos from Flickr, so we're going to write a constructor that can be passed the Flickr API key and a download location. We'll just save the API key and the download location. Now that we have a way to initialize our component, Let's test it. We create a tests Python package. We'll create the package here. And inside, we'll create a test Flickr downloader Python. We'll define a class for our test suit, test Flickr download, which is inherited from the built-in object. We'll define our first test method, test init correct. We'll create a new Flickr downloader object here with a test API and a directory. We'll import the Flickr downloader here. All right, let's check our test. We'll have to install PyTest and we should be good to go. All right, let's run our test. We can see that the test passed, but it's not very useful. The API key we passed doesn't look very correct. And the directory we passed is actually a number. So what do we do? If you remember, one of the things we mentioned as a benefit of unit testing is that it usually leads to better designs. So let's redesign our Flickr downloader to be more testable. First of all, we need a way of expressing that something is wrong with the parameters. We'll define an exception that will raise whenever something bad happens in our code. So we define it here. Flickr downloader exception. In our constructor now, we should validate the parameters we receive. For example, let's make sure we get two strings here. So we make sure that the API key is a string. If not, we'll raise the flicker. And we'll also check the download look. We'll also check if the API key is just an empty string. And we should also make sure that the download location exists and that it's a directory. So let's do that. We'll make sure that we pass something here. And we'll make sure we get a non-empty string. Otherwise, we'll raise the Flickr downloader exception.
We'll also make sure that our download location exists. And that it's actually a directory. Okay. We'll also make sure that we have the correct import. We'll add the exception. Now we have something we can work with. Let's update our test now. We'll wrap our call in a try accept block and we'll catch the Flickr downloader exception here. If we get an exception, we'll fail the test. This is the exception we're expecting, and we'll fail the test. We also have to import our exception, and we also have to import bytes. Let's run our test now. As you can see, it now fails. Since the test is named test init correct, let's update the parameters so that we should have a pass test here. We need an API key that is of string type and that has at least one character, and we also need a valid directory. The API key is covered now. For the download directory, we'll use the tempdir fixture of PyTest. PyTest provides us with a bunch of very useful fixtures to help us with our tests. We just need to pass the expected parameter in our test method, in this case, tmp dir, and PyTest will automatically inject the correct thing in that parameter. In this case, it will create a temporary directory for us and it will provide us with a file-like object. We'll pass the path to that using the string function. Let's run the test again. We'll see that it works beautifully. Now let's test for a negatives case. We'll write the test init missing download folder. We'll pass the same API key to our Flickr downloader constructor and a random string value for the download directory. We need to make sure that our code will raise the Flickr downloader exception if we call it this way, so we wrap our call with a construct with my test raises Flickr downloader exception. In this case, we make sure that whatever is in this context will have to raise this exception. Let's see it in action. Excellent, everything works.